News and Campaign Report with Peter Sissons at 9 o'clock. John Major again confronts the sleaze issue as the election campaign begins in earnest. He says he won't have a witch hunt. Labour and the Liberal Democrats may yet field an anti-sleaze candidate against one of his MPs. Four Palestinians are killed as the violence escalates and the recriminations with Israel grow more bitter. And a miracle escape for a baby as a runaway racehorse tramples his pushchair. Good evening. One month to polling day, and at last it's beginning to look more like a campaign. John Major tried again to clear the air about sleaze, and Tory party infighting remained an issue in Scotland. All the party leaders said they wanted to get to the real issues, but all were drawn again on the cash for questions affair. Mr Major said he wouldn't indulge in a witch hunt against the MPs accused. Labour and the Liberal Democrats are still discussing putting up an anti-sleaze candidate against the Conservative Neil Hamilton. The first of our special campaign editions of the 9 o'clock news begins with this report from our political editor, Robin Oakley. From exaltation to anxiety. Five years ago, they were leaning out of the windows at Conservative Central Office, cheering their fourth election victory in a row. Today, as the Prime Minister took to his battle bus, the Tories were apprehensive. How were they to achieve lift-off from the morass of sleaze stories in which their campaign so far been mired? Seeking to exhaust the issue before tomorrow's manifesto launch, Mr Major took every question going, explaining why he won't force out candidates facing accusations. I think everyone who retains the support of their constituency party and who protests their innocence, as the members concerned do, has a right to stand in this election and to fight the election upon the policies and the philosophy that they support. That applies explicitly to Neil Hamilton. It applies as a general principle as well. For all the backroom advice, the party's high command hasn't been consistent. Last week, the accused Tories were being encouraged to fall on their swords. But under the watchful eye of his wife, the Prime Minister today insisted he'd join no witch hunts. But I'm not going to bow to the witch hunt mentality of saying that anybody who faces unsubstantiated charges must lead public life. I don't think asking people who may be wholly innocent to stand aside is leadership. That may be partisan political vindictiveness and self-interest. I do not myself regard it as leadership. Opposition parties claimed they were anxious to get down to policy questions, but Labour's leader insisted sleaze was a leadership issue. That the Conservatives have brought this issue upon themselves. Uh, that they have suppressed the report at the end of the parliamentary term that could have laid it to rest. Even last night, Mr. Major's again writing letters. On Sunday, they want their members of parliament to stand down. On Monday, they back away from it. On Tuesday, we're not quite sure what they're doing. Parading former Tory minister Alan Howarth, who's to head a task force designed to pull over Tory waverers, Mr. Blair insisted that Labour was now the One Nation Party. When I talk of One Nation, I mean a Britain with shared values and purpose, where merit comes before privilege, which stands up for the interests of the many, not the few, and with no one cast out or cast aside. His spin doctors were content at a less than bruising encounter with the media. So was Mr. Blair. All those hard questions they never asked. <laughs> The Liberal Democrats staged an entertainment to underpin their claim that Labour and Tories are playing punch and Judy politics while they concentrate on serious issues. But they didn't need that much bashing to get into sleaze questions too. The Prime Minister's fault in this matter was not to let the matter reach its proper conclusion through the House of Commons and call the election early. That was the right way to deal with this. Uh, and I greatly regret that the Prime Minister has not dealt with it in that way. Former Trade Minister Neil Hamilton remains the focus of the political pressures on sleaze. The Lib Dems tonight joined Labour in saying they'd search for an agreed anti-corruption candidate to put up against him. The Tories, hoping to bury sleaze tomorrow with the launch of the manifesto they unloaded tonight, called the plan a gimmick. Tony Blair's launched his theme that Labour offers reassurance, not revolution. The Liberal Democrats have shown flair. 
Now Mr Major hopes his combative performance has given him the chance of getting his message across without being drowned by noises off. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. The three party leaders were all out campaigning around the country today. As they start their election tours, a poll in tomorrow's Guardian by ICM suggests Labour's lead is the lowest since last November. The poll, which was conducted over the Easter weekend, puts Labour on 46%, down two points from the last ICM poll in March. The Conservatives on 32%, up two, and the Liberal Democrats on 17, down one. We've three reports on the campaign trail with the main party leaders, starting with Clarence Mitchell, who's following the Prime Minister. For two weeks, John Major has been out and about meeting people, but it's only now that his full-scale campaigning has begun. The Conservatives hope that his meet-the-people style will prove to be one of their secret weapons. And they say, where better to start than at a do-it-yourself superstore in South London? So it was to Croydon North, the Tories' fourth most vulnerable seat, that the Prime Minister's battle bus came for its first formal outing. In tow, disgorged from two other buses, the ever-increasing media entourage that Mr Major calls his extended family. His political opponents may still be trying to make the sleaze issue stick. Mr Major, for his part, seemed happy and relaxed away from Westminster, meeting people face to face. Thank you very much. Is it really? Oh, well, the very best of luck. very much indeed. Having, he believes, dealt with all the sleaze questions, the Prime Minister says he now wants light shone on the real issues. So what did the voters think of his campaign style? I think it's splendid. I mean, it's so very casual and sort of man of the people, isn't it? This time we are thinking of voting to Labour this time. Yeah, I don't know. So meeting him has made no difference necessarily? I don't think so, because I, we feel very angry about the schools, you know. It's about time, I think, that people started looking at talking about the real issues rather than being sidetracked with the sleaze campaign. Everywhere the majors go, a team of young party workers do what they can to control over-enthusiastic reporters and cameramen. The Prime Minister sometimes lends a hand. You be careful when you're walking backwards. Yeah. Yeah. How's your garden, Hunter? You're close to the pond. Be very Lovely. <laughs> With his battle bus tour of the nation underway, Mr Major wants to get across the message that Britain is booming. He has four weeks on the road before the electorate decides whether it'll back him. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News, with John Major's campaign. On Labour's first full day of campaigning, Tony Blair took his battle bus to Northampton. Mr Blair aimed his message specifically at wavering Tory voters, urging them to back him at the election. Our political correspondent, Jeremy Vine, is with the Blair campaign. Well, the sun is disappearing from view as the first day of the Labour campaign draws to a close. But the onset of spring has provided Mr Blair with a handy on-the-road metaphor. A change of seasons, he says. Time for a change of government. Hello, Northampton. <laughs> Labour want the word leadership as the backdrop to this campaign. Easily done if they supply the backdrops. The operation is designed to be risk-free, but Mr Blair had few qualms about sinking himself into this crowd. I want to see your promises actually being kept for a change. I understand. That's why we're making promises that we can... I want to tell my son that he is going to be safe at school. He wants to be a scientist. The one abiding impression of the day, no matter how sophisticated Labour's campaigning may be, in the end a lot of it still comes down to handshakes and bananas. 89 pence, please. No, we're going for the bananas. 89 pence, please. And it comes down to old-fashioned battle buses, too. Labour are paying a daredevil camera crew to follow theirs. Front seats are for invited journalists. And then through here, moving towards the rear, are the people who work in the engine room of Mr Blair's campaign. For example, Angie Hunter here, who, who is his personal assistant. And then moving through here is Alison Campbell, Mr Blair's press secretary, who's with him almost all the time and then the Labour leader himself. What are you working on, Mr Blair? I'm working on the speech. There will be many speeches as Mr Blair attempts to put dividing lines between his party and Mr Majors. Not all that easy when many say Labour's biggest advances have come because they've moved closer to the Conservatives. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, on the Blair campaign trail. The Liberal Democrat leader Paddy Ashton called for Labour and the Conservatives to return to the real campaign issues like health and education. Our political correspondent Carolyn Quinn is with the Ashdown campaign. 
The Liberal Democrats don't have the money of the other two parties, only £6 million in total. But what they do have, they intend to focus on campaigns like this poster unveiled today and on targeted campaigns in 50 constituencies across the nation. Making a dramatic show of their latest campaign theme, the Liberal Democrats today were insisting they want to move the agenda away from mudslinging and onto the election's key issues like education, health and crime. <laughs> but a month of photo opportunities began in traditional fashion for Paddy Ashdown and his wife Jane. My wife is really a DI merchant. I was just, oh. just, <laughs> just saying, I hope they don't yeah, trample on your again. flowers. Though as they ventured into the gardens of England, the press also made their traditional mark. Party strategists insist this campaign will be less frenetic than in 92, despite appearances. They say there'll be fewer staged events and more quality time with the public. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Can you sign it for me too? That's something Paddy Ashdown clearly relishes as he clocks up the miles in his battle bus. I suppose this is more politician with ears open and mouth less open than has been the case before. It's certainly time with people. The thing I said to my campaign team when I asked them to plan this was politician less stuck up and more stuck in. His action man image may sway some voters, but Ashdown insists it's his commitment to education spending through tax rises and honesty of policy that will make the real difference. Even though some Liberal Democrats are reaching for the sky, others fear the strategy may prove too radical to attract the wavering Tory voters in many of their target seats. Carolyn Quinn, BBC News, with Paddy Ashdown's campaign. The Scottish Secretary Michael Forsyth began his campaign fending off questions about two leading Scottish Tories who've resigned after revelations about their private lives. Mr Forsyth said, I could have planned it better. Our Scotland political editor, Brian Taylor, reports. Tories in Eastwood near Glasgow meet tonight to select a candidate for this, the safest Conservative seat in Scotland. An orderly conclusion to a sequence of events which has thrown the Scottish party into turmoil. First, former Minister Alan Stewart stood down in Eastwood in the face of tabloid allegations about his private life. Then, the Scottish party chairman, Sir Michael Hurst, was tipped for the seat. A whispering campaign against him prompted press inquiries and Sir Michael quit his post, admitting past indiscretions. Finally today, the Scottish Secretary made his first public comment at the party's Scottish campaign launch. The new chairman, Annabel Goldie, blamed Tory malcontents for stirring up trouble. Mr Forsyth said he knew nothing about that, but conceded the affair had caused damage. Well, um, I could have um, planned it better. Uh, uh, of course it's a setback. Michael Hurst was uh, a key uh, element in our campaign, uh, uh, a formidable uh, campaigner and someone I was relying on uh, very considerably. My big pleasure in declaring Opposition this leaders such as Jim Wallace of the Liberal Democrats agreed with Mr Forsyth that the campaign should now shift from personal to political problems. The private lives of individuals should have no part in our election campaign. Uh, that is my view as leader and it's one which I expect the party to follow. Indeed, talking to colleagues, uh, there's no appetite whatsoever uh, to go down that road. Labour endorsed that but questioned Mr Forsyth's command of his own party. Scotland's Tory party leader doesn't even seem to notice uh, that there is a, an uncontrollable, undignified civil war going on in his own party. Out on the campaign trail, the SNP leader said the voters were declaring themselves sick of the focus upon sleaze. People haven't been asking about individuals' private lives in the Tory party or elsewhere. They've been asking about what policies do you have for the future of Scotland. A new dimension tonight as this Lanarkshire site was selected for a 5,000 job development. Opposition leaders accused the Tories of accelerating the news to divert attention from their party's problems. Mr Forsyth denies that but can now only hope that attention will shift to issues like jobs and the economy rather than sleaze. Ryan Taylor, BBC News. That's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. There'll be more later in the programme. But now, the rest of the day's news. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu... We've been talking to the people who refuse to vote and ask, is there a growing gap between rulers and ruled? But first, over to Anne Perkins at our campaign news desk at Westminster. Evening, Peter. 
rather like sleaze, the question of whether there's a television debate between the party leaders is an issue that refuses to go away. Unlike sleaze, of course, the Conservatives don't want it to. In a carefully scripted challenge at his morning press conference, John Major couldn't resist getting personal. Chicken, he declared, and he wasn't referring to Paddy Ashdown. Another day, another queue at party headquarters. The daily media round goes on as it always has, one leader at a time. Today, John Major tried to taunt Tony Blair into sharing a platform for the first time in front of the cameras. Turkeys may not vote for Christmas, but chickens apparently run away from broadcasts. I have accepted the proposals. It is up to the Labour Party to see whether they will. Compare that, though, to John Major five years ago, and it looks like the tactic of a leader in a corner. Every party politician that expects to lose tries that trick of yeah. debate. Now Tony Blair looks like he's out in front and playing hard to get. He denies he's blocking the debate and blaming the Tories. There's got to be some goodwill and good faith in negotiating over this. But the parties have perfected their management of media appearances and Labour's campaign team is all but rising off any hope of doing things differently. I think that it is a very, very remote possibility now because I don't believe the Prime Minister is serious in his approach. I think the remarks uh, made since, uh, particularly by the Prime Minister this morning, make me very pessimistic about the prospect for renewing a debate, which is a great pity. Even if the parties did reopen the talks, they'd still be far apart. Paddy Ashdown's role and the issue of whether the leaders could question each other directly hadn't been resolved when the negotiations broke down. But those questions now seem academic. The arguments moved on, and the political game is about making sure the other side gets the blame. John Pienaar, BBC News. Westminster. Debates do have one advantage to all the parties. Free airtime, even the most basic party election broadcast, costs at least £25,000 to make. And spending by the parties looks like reaching a new high, though only the Liberal Democrats are prepared to admit how high. In total on this election, if you take money spent at the centre and in the constituencies, between five and six million pounds, uh, of that, we'll be spending about two and a half million pounds mm -hmm. at the centre, which, as I say, is enough to allow us to do the job we want to do, although it will not be able to finance luxurious, uh, uh, expensive, negative advertising as the other parties do. As for the others, it's safe to assume that Labour will spend more, much more, than the Lib Dems, and the Tories will spend most. At the last election, the Tories were reckoned to have spent £10 million during the campaign, Labour £7 million. This morning, neither was prepared to admit what they'd spend in the coming month, though Labour promised to come clean later. Much of our money is coming in through donations over the next uh, few weeks, and uh, we believe we'll have a generous response uh, from the public. What I can say is we will publish all our figures, as we have regularly done, both uh, for donations to the Labour Party and what we are spending. These will all be published at the appropriate time. I, I must say, if Mr Blair is so open, why doesn't he tell us who actually has paid money into his blind trust? If he wants a bit of openness, let him start with that openness, and then I'll take his other challenges seriously. And where does the money go? Even in the age of high-tech and ultra-targeted direct mail, the biggest item is still the poster site. But there's a much cheaper kind of me messaging machinery available, which by the next election could rival the roadside hoarding, a site on the internet. They're all wired up. The Tories give you press releases, tours of number 10, and even a game. Now we're going to take part in the Prime Minister's favourite game, which is cricket. Spot the Prime Minister's cricket ball. There's even a monthly prize. I think, I think it's a box of chocolates from the House of Commons. At the Liberal Democrat site, you can win the general election. And the site's fully interactive with um, a general election game um, where you stand the chance to win a lunch in the House of Commons by winning as many Liberal Democrat seats as possible. But the real surfers say they could have done much better. I think it's fair to say that none of them have done a particularly good job. Um, they're, all, they're all better than nothing, but none of them are, are, are leading edge. The Labour site uh, falls down in a number of ways, and it's good in a number of ways. It's very user-friendly to navigate. What it doesn't have is any way to use the interactivity of the internet. At the BBC site, you can interact. You can swing with Peter Snow. Let's make it a 6% swing to Labour. 
Labour would then be well ahead and would have a majority of 33. Do we need Peter Snow anymore is the question. <laughs> Must have Peter Snow. Back to you, Peter Sissons, in the studio. And Perkins. This, it may come as no surprise to you to learn, is the longest election campaign this century. John Major made it into a six-week marathon to try to get his message of economic recovery across. But what do voters make of it all? Opinion polls suggest that general disenchantment with politicians has never been greater. Each night, at this point on the 9 o'clock news, we'll be reporting in depth on an election issue. And tonight, our political correspondent, John Sopel, examines voter apathy. In the campaign for hearts and minds, but ultimately votes, there's no escape from this election. It fills the papers, it's on our screens, and hoardings like this don't stay blank for long. But for all that, more than a quarter of the adult population won't vote. Westminster isn't a stop on their route. Nowhere is the disenchantment greater than in the black community. Only 40% turnouts expected, and among black youth, that figure drops sharply to just 16%. Only one in six going to vote. If we want more uh, black representation in the House Parliament, then we've got, you know, we've got a, a push for these campaigns for this. Now, if we don't campaign for anything... Do we have we... to campaign? Because our mama, our daddy and everything, they've been doing it when they were young, they've been voting and everything. What did they gain? Nothing. So we grow up and we realise when our, our old people did something, they did vote and they don't get nothing out of it, what do we have to vote? What's the point? It's it not comes point. back to having a stake in it. Because it's not our favour. So why do we have to but vote? Having, having a stake in what? In the country, I mean, because at the end of the day, you know, I was born here, this is my country, yeah, you know, see, and, see, and, and yours and, and whoever else is, you it's know. Like, my, view, my personal view is that I don't owe them anything, they don't owe me anything, so I'm just yeah. going to get along and do what I yeah. can, you know yeah. what I mean? And that's why I'm just not interested in like, mm -mm. The parties are spending record amounts on advertising in this election. The sum will run into several millions. But who for? There's not much of a welcome here for politicians. Harper Hay in Manchester is like many other inner city wards. Turnout is low, registration poor, apathy rife. Hi, can I ask you, would you be voting in the election? No, not interested. Uh, can no. I ask you, how are you going to be voting in the election? I'm not voting for anybody. No? No. Bye. Not going to vote. Not going to vote. No. 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 In the last general election, there were parts of this constituency where turnout was below 50%, and so party workers pay these people scant attention because, crudely, the returns are so poor. Politics, as practised at Westminster, goes over the heads of these people. Debbie Asprey and her partner, Michael Washington, are in their early 20s. Michael's got a job, Debbie plans to go to college, and they have high hopes for the future, but they've never voted and don't intend to. The only difference I can tell is the colours. <laughs> Say, because one's blue, one's red, one's yellow, and then it's the green party. That's the only difference I can tell. Because there's that much... Um, how much arguing between them all and the contradictions and... You see them in Parliament and I never understand anything what they're going on about. But don't you think that some one of the parties might be able to improve your standard of living? Or do you, do you think they're all the same? I just don't think it makes a difference to us. I mean, they, they, it's like a different world. They've, they live in a different world. They've got a high paying jobs and whatever. And obviously they want to protect that and that's it. I don't think it's relevant to us. There's an army of council workers responsible for getting people on the electoral register, but they can't make them vote. Andrew Scallon, the deputy returning officer for Manchester, understands better than most why people shun the polling stations. There are a whole series of reasons why uh, people are not turning out to vote. Um, and there's no easy answer to it. People are feeling cut off from the political process. There are people who have difficulty actually going to vote. There are people who don't understand uh, the actual process of voting itself because there's been no civic education on this subject. As well as those who don't bother to vote, there are those who simply don't register. Estimates vary, but it's thought that as many as 10% of those people eligible simply aren't on the electoral register. Potentially, that's 4 million people missing. A huge political force that's turned its back 
on the democratic process. While pop stars sing about it, returning officers talk quietly of polling booths and ballot boxes at their annual conference in Scarborough. In their own election for new officers, somewhat surprisingly for such a sophisticated electorate, 30% of them didn't even bother to vote. A lot of us uh, in the last five, seven years have been abroad to monitor, observe elections. And it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful sight to see two or three hundred people queuing up outside a polling station at seven o'clock in the morning. Where do you see that in this country now? Hardly ever. What Turnouts of 90, 95 um, percent. And, and without question, everybody sees it as a sense of duty to go out and cast their vote. Well, we seem to have lost that particular within this country. I think there is a lot that can be changed in terms of... At their conference, the range of ideas to encourage voting went from the big and philosophical, would proportional representation, for example, give those people most alienated more of a stake, to the small practical ones. Should voting take place at weekends, with polling booths in supermarkets? In the meantime, there's a variety of campaigns to get people to vote, particularly the 18 to 24 age group. But these people seem more interested in partying than party politics. Parties of today don't represent the general public. Um, I mean, Labour and uh, Conservative are so closely matched that there's no other alternative. I don't really take a notice of it, tell you the truth. It's all the same. It all lies. The club they've come to is running a high-profile and controversial campaign of its own. The Ministry of Sound in London, that's not a Whitehall department, has produced some highly provocative ads which it's showing in cinemas up and down the country. Our country ain't ours anymore. It's not ours anymore, and I want it back. Do you understand? I want my country back. Yeah, I want all the filth and the scum out. I want this country run by white people. The first thing politicians should do to ensure that young people get involved in politics is frankly not even try and get them involved. I've yet to see a politician do anything worthwhile where young people have turned around and said, wow, that was really cool. And that's the difference with ministries campaign, clubbing and politics, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. But what we're demonstrating is that if you talk to young people in the right language, they'll listen. Rock the vote, use the vote, swing the vote, Operation Black Vote will all have their limited successes. And even though turnout in Britain is high by international comparison, whoever wins on election night will have done so without the votes of millions of people, the people untouched by the poster war. John Sopel reporting. Now here to examine the impact of the electoral refusenics is Peter Stowe, who will be with us throughout the campaign. Peter, how significant are they? Well, Peter, it was the huge stay away at the local elections last year that first raised the alarm. It was the lowest turnout in a quarter of a century. And that disenchantment, as John Sopel has found, could indeed affect turnout on May the 1st, particularly when you look at the young and the less well-off. Now, Murray's figures suggest that whereas well over half, 56% of 18 to 24-year-olds said that they were certain to vote on election day in 1992, now only 44% of this group say they're certain to vote this time. Even among the most elderly group, who turned out in strength 87% last time, that's down to less than three quarters today. And among unskilled workers, whom the market researchers call the D's and the E's, 81% said they were sure to vote in 1992, but Murray found only 61% down the bottom here saying that they would vote this time. Now, some of the other pollsters find signs of apathy rather less marked than this, but they all agree that the younger and less well-off people are, the less likely, Peter, they are to vote. What's the measure of the task facing Labour and the Tories in their tussle for power? Whatever the records that we're going to find for turnout this time, it's sure that this election will break records on our swingometer. If the Tories win again, it'll be a record recovery and their fifth successive victory, a record unbeaten since 1826. But if Labour win, they too will break records. Now, the best swing Labour have achieved since 1949, uh, 1945 has been 3%, enough to turn only a handful of these blue Tory seats red for Labour. Labour have to equal the 5% 
record swing since the war, achieved by Tory Margaret Thatcher in 79, if Mr Blair is to have a small overall majority. Now, throughout March, the opinion polls were suggesting a swing of much more than that, threatening a lot more of those Conservative seats, and broadly averaging around 16%. A swing that would be enough to see Labour in with a majority of around 250. But tonight's Guardian ICM poll puts the swing sharply down from there on 11%. The best news, if it's right, that the Conservatives have had for five months. Even so, Mr Major still starts the campaign, Peter, the worst placed Prime Minister since the war. Peter Snow. And the main election headlines tonight. John Major has confronted the sleaze issue as the election campaign begins in earnest. He said he wouldn't have a witch hunt and accused Tony Blair of running away from a TV debate. And Labour and the Liberal Democrats may yet field an anti-sleaze candidate against a Conservative MP. I'm joined now by our political editor, Robin Oakley. John Major can't afford another nightmare week. Has he done enough to put the sleaze issue to bed? I think the sleaze issue will probably subside a bit now, Peter, but I don't think it will go away completely. I mean, we've seen two former Tory ministers pushed out, as it were, as Tory candidates. The chairman of the Scottish Tory party resigned. The media appetite for these kind of stories is not going to diminish. Every time you throw a body off the sledge, the, the chasing pack just gets more excited, really. But we are going to move into a phase now, three days, of the main parties producing their party manifestos. That is going to put the emphasis back on policy for a while, but sleaze won't go away finally until we see Sir Gordon Downey's report in the new Parliament. Now, this ICM poll tomorrow is pretty interesting, and incidentally, we reported that the Lib Dems were down one. In fact, they're up one in the ICM poll tomorrow. But it still gives the lowest Labour lead in any poll for five months. How will that go down at central office? Well, inevitably, that will cheer the Tories. They've been waiting an awful long time for some good news. Rounds of by-elections, local government elections, parliamentary uh, by-elections. It's all been bad news. Here is something that will give them some hope they're turning the corner at last but although that will cheer the Tories and particularly the figures showing that they're on a par with Labour in terms of economic competence there's probably good news in that for Tony Blair as well because he's been very worried about his party getting too complacent he calls himself a warrior against complacency all this talk of possible landslides to Labour may frighten some voters who are preparing themselves for a change say they've had enough of the Tories but they don't want to see Labour in with say a majority of 200 seats so this will actually be quite good news for Mr Blair in that it will steady people's nerves a little bit and put Labour back on their toes. A quick one on the manifesto, the Tory manifesto tomorrow. A big idea? A big relaunch? More a big theme. Uh, the one that Mr Major has been outlining in recent speeches, uh, ending what he calls the, the false security of dependence with the real security of independence. Tory plans on pensions, long-term care for the elderly, uh, wider share ownership, that kind of thing. Making people more independent, choice and opportunity. Robin Oakley, thank you. And that's the nine o'clock news tonight, extended as it will be between now and polling day to bring you the fullest coverage of the election campaign. Newsnight is on BBC Two at 10.30 from us all here. Good night. Good evening. The Prime Minister launched the Conservative election campaign proper in Croydon today. And the choice of site wasn't accidental. The main political parties see the South East as a vital battleground. No coincidence that the Prime Minister's first visit in his election battle bus was to the Tories' fourth most vulnerable seat in the country. Well, he's going to win this. Gonna win. Okay. So he's going to win this. Drive. Drive. Yes. The boundaries help him, and he's going to come and join us. And no surprise that when he arrived in Croydon North, Mr. Major chose to highlight one of the more obvious <laughs> symbols of economic well-being: an out-of-town shopping centre. After the allegations of sleaze, this was do-it-yourself electioneering in a DIY store. And some customers were keen to display the proof that he was getting his message across. There was no booing, there was no heckling, and everyone came up and they wanted to shake his hand. People were bringing bits of paper, and that's the reception he got, and that proves everything. For others, though, the shopping proved a bigger attraction. This is not a show of strong leadership, and it's time for a change. I honestly don't know what I'd like to see. But I certainly don't want this lot in. There'll be fierce campaigning by senior political figures in Croydon North and other key southeast marginals over the next few weeks. On a swing of less than 1%, Croydon North, Hazen Harlington, Luton South, Edmonton and Dover would all turn from Tory blue to New Labour red. 
On a swing of under 2%, Brentford and Isleworth, Harlow, Mitcham and Morden, Crawley and Eltham would follow. Labour will also try to win seats where they need a swing of between 2 and 5%. These include Basildon, Ilford South, Battersea and Gravesham in Kent. Now! Kent was where the Labour leader chose to unveil his party's poster campaign at the weekend. All 16 parliamentary seats in the county are currently held by the Tories. It's one statistic Labour's already committed to change. The Liberal Democrats, who currently have just one MP in the whole region, are urging voters not to see this election as a two-party fight. Already a major force in South East local government, they believe they can add at least two more parliamentary seats.